Hi everyone, Ms. Shames here. Um, we're going to be starting a new fantasy book called The Hunger Games. Um, this is actually a fantasy series. Some of you might have heard of it, either um, maybe you've read the books before, or maybe you've seen the movies. Um, and we're going to try to get through as much of this as possible. And if we don't get through all of it in our time together, then I, we're definitely going to leave the audio recording available for you if you wish to continue reading it. So our teaching point is that readers of fantasy think about the implications of the setting, concepts of power, internal and external problems the characters face. So what are they facing inside themselves and what are they facing in the world at large? And we're going to be thinking about life lessons or themes that readers and characters can learn from what's happening in the story. Let's get started. I'm excited. We're going to be listening to an audio recording, um, but I'll be stopping to do some thinking as we're listening. Sorry, it's just taking a second to load. Bear with me. The Hunger Games by Suzanne Collins. Chapter one. When I wake up, the other side of the bed is cold. My fingers stretch out, seeking Prim's warmth, but finding only the rough canvas cover of our mattress. She must have had bad dreams and climbed in with our mother. Of course she did. This is the day of the reaping. I prop myself up on one elbow, there's enough light in the bedroom to see them. My little sister, Prim, curled up on her side, cocooned in my mother's body, their cheeks pressed together. In sleep, my mother looks younger, still worn, but not so beaten down. Prim's face is as fresh as a raindrop, as lovely as the primrose for which she was named. My mother was very beautiful once, too, or so they tell me. Sitting at Prim's knees, guarding her, was the world's ugliest cat, mashed in nose, half of one ear missing, eyes the color of rotting squash. Prim named him Buttercup, insisting that his muddy yellow coat matched the bright flower. He hates me, or at least distrusts me. Even though it was years ago, I think he still remembers how I tried to drown him in a bucket when Prim brought him home. Scrawny kitten, belly swollen with worms, crawling with fleas. Last thing I needed was another mouth to feed. But Prim begged so hard, cried even, I had to let him stay. It turned out okay. My mother got rid of the vermin, and he's a born mouser, even catches the occasional rat. Sometimes when I clean a kill, I feed Buttercup the entrails. He stopped hissing at me. Entrails, no hissing. This is the closest we will ever come to love. I swing my legs off the bed and slap... So I want to just stop here to start to think about some of the characters that we've learned about so far. Um, so we know that there's a narrator. Um, it sounds like she's kind of taking care and, or looking out for her little sister, Prim. Um, so Prim is the younger sister. And I've made the inference that she loves connecting with other beings. Um, when we first are introduced to Prim, she's cuddled up against her mom. Um, she also brings a cat home and begs to have the cat stay. So I think Prim just kind of loves love and being close to others. Um, and then we know that there's a mom that was once beautiful. It sounds like she cares for her children. It um, sounded like she was kind of guarding them, wanting to protect them. And I even heard, you know, um, the narrator say that she looked a little bit beaten down. So I'm almost making the inference that maybe something harsh has happened to her. And I didn't write this down, but another character is Buttercup. Um, and we know that the narrator and Buttercup don't seem to have the best relationship, but the narrator kind of tolerates Buttercup because it makes Prim happy. Um, so I just wanted to stop and think and collect some ideas about who the characters are so far. I'd into my hunting boots. Supple leather has molded to my feet. I pull on the trousers, a shirt, tuck my long dark braid into a cap, and grab a, my forage bag. On the table, under the wooden bowl to protect it from hungry rats and cats alike, sits a perfect little goat cheese wrapped in basil leaves. 
Prim's gift to me on reaping day. I put the cheese carefully in my pocket as I slip outside. Our part of District 12, nicknamed The Seam, is usually crawling with coal miners heading out to the morning shift at this hour. Men and women with hunched shoulders, swollen knuckles, many who have long since stopped trying to scrub the coal dust out of their broken nails, the lines of their sunken faces. But today, the black cinder streets are empty. Shutters on the squat gray houses are closed. The reaping isn't until two. May as well sleep in, if you can. Our house is almost at the edge of the seam. I only have to pass a few gates to reach the scruffy field called the meadow, separating the meadow from the woods, in fact, enclosing all of District 12, is a high chain link fence topped with barbed wire loops. In theory, it's supposed to be electrified 24 hours a day as a deterrent to the predators that live in the woods, packs of wild dogs, lone cougars, bears that used to threaten our streets. But since we're lucky to get two or three hours of electricity in the evenings, it's usually safe to touch. Even so, I always take a moment to listen carefully for the hum that means the fence is live. Right now, it's silent as stone. Concealed by a clump of bushes, I flatten out on my belly and slide under a two-foot stretch that's been loose for years. There are several other weak spots in the fence, but this one is so close to home, I almost always enter the woods here. As soon as I'm in the trees, I retrieve a bow and sheath of arrows from a hollow log. Electrified or not, the fence has been successful at keeping the flesh eaters out of District 12. Inside the woods, they roam freely, and they are... There are added concerns of, like venomous, venomous, venomous snakes, rabid animals, and no real paths to follow. But there's also food if you know how to find it. My father knew, and he taught me some before he was blown to bits in a mine explosion. There was nothing even to bury. I... Um, so I wanted to stop and think here because I feel like we just learned some important things. Um, one thing I'm starting to notice or grow a theory about is I think one of the social issues that is going to be coming up in this book is poverty, which means not having enough money for the things you need to survive. And I say this, I think this might be a social issue in this story, is because the narrator, for one example, was worried about having the cat, Buttercup, because it was another mouth to feed. Um, also, the narrator said that Prim gave the narrator a gift of like goat cheese wrapped in a leaf. You know, normally that's not what you'd get somebody as a gift or what you consider a gift. Um, it kind of seems that hunger is common and they're only getting two to three hours of electricity in the evening. So all these things, all these like small details are leading up for me to think that I think think this community of people is pretty poor. They're living in poverty. Um, we also started to learn a bit about an important, or what seems to be an important character relationship, and that's between the narrator and her father. Um, it seems that they had a strong relationship, um, even though the father is now deceased. Um, he took a risk, and he gave the narrator a bow and arrow, even though he knows that this could lead to a lot of trouble for him. Um, so I wanted to point out those things before we move on. So let's keep going. I was 11 then. Five years later, I still wake up screaming for him to run. Even though trespassing in the woods is illegal and poaching carries the severest of penalties, more people would risk it if they had weapons. But most are not bold enough to venture out with just a knife. My bow is a rarity crafted by my father, along with a few others that I keep well hidden in the woods, carefully wrapped in waterproof covers. My father could have made good money selling them, but if the officials found out, he would have been publicly executed for inciting a rebellion. Most of the peacekeepers turn a blind eye to the few of us who hunt, because they're as hungry for fresh meat as anybody is. In fact, they're among our best customers. But the idea that someone might be arming the seam would never have been allowed. In the fall, a few brave souls sneak into the woods to harvest apples, but always in sight of the meadow, always close enough to run back to the safety of District 12 if trouble arises. District, District 12, where you can starve to death in safety, 
I mutter. Then I glance quickly over my shoulder. Even here... Sorry, I just wanted to stop and think a little bit about the setting. Um, so the author has been describing this like District 12, and it seems to be a really unique place. So I wanted to stop and kind of collect my thoughts about District 12. In my opinion, it seems to be a very grim, dark, hungry, and controlling place. Um, it seems like people can't afford many things. Um, there's also the woods where it is illegal to go to. And it sounds like the people who are in charge are very cruel. Um, some other things I started to notice about District 12 is that um, the narrator mentioned before that people were like, a lot of them were coal miners. They were covered in dust and kind of stopped bothering to even try to clean up the dust and that they had these kind of sulken faces. So I think it's a place where people tend to be pretty unhappy. Um, there's also like barbed wire around um, that kind of encloses the space. So it seems like there's some people in charge that are very controlling. Um, uh, hypothetically, they're keeping people safe, um, but it seems to be a dark, sad, unpleasant place to be in. And I think that that's gonna affect the story and the characters a lot. In the middle of nowhere, you worry someone might overhear you. When I was younger, I scared my mother to death. The things I would blurt out about District 12 about the people who run our country, Pan Am, from the far off city called the capital. Eventually I understood this would lead us to more trouble. So I learned to hold my tongue and to turn my features into in, an indifferent mask so that no one could ever read my thoughts. Do my work quietly in school, make only polite small talk in the public market, discuss little more than trades in the hob, which is the black market where I make most of my money. Even at home, where I'm less pleasant, I avoid discussing tricky topics like the reaping or food shortages or the hunger games. Prim might begin to repeat my words and then where would we be? In the woods waits the only person with whom I can be myself, Gale. I can feel the muscles in my face relaxing, my pace quickening as I climb the hills to our place, a rock ledge overlooking a valley. A thicket of berry bushes protects it from unwanted eyes. The sight of him waiting there brings on a smile. Gale says, I never smile except in the woods. Hey, Catnip, says Gale. My real name is Katniss, but when I first told him, I had barely whispered it, so we thought I'd said Catnip. Then when this crazy lynx started following me around the woods looking for handouts, it became his official nickname for me. I finally had to kill the lynx because he scared off game. I almost regretted it because he wasn't bad company but I got a decent price for his pelt. Look what I shot. Gail holds up a loaf of bread with an arrow stuck in it, and I laugh. It's real bakery bread, not the flat, dense loaves we make from our grain rations. I take it in my hands, pull the, out the arrow, and hold the puncture in the crust to my nose, inhaling the fragrance that makes my mouth flood with saliva. Fine bread like this is for special occasions. Mmm. Still warm, I say. He must have been at the bakery at the crack of dawn to trade for it. What did it cost you? Just a squirrel. Think the old man was feeling sentimental this morning, says Gail. Even wished me luck. Well, we all feel a little close, closer today, don't we? I say, not even bothering to roll my eyes. Prim left us a cheese. I pull it out. His expression brightens at the treat. Thank you, Prim. We'll have a real feast. Suddenly, he falls into a capital accent as he mimics Effie Trinket, the maniacally upbeat woman who arrives once a year to read out the names at the reaping. I almost forgot! Happy Hunger Games! He plucks a few blackberries from the bushes around us. And may the odds! He tosses a berry in a high arc toward me. I catch it in my mouth and break the delicate skin with my teeth. The sweet tartness explodes in my tongue. Be ever in your favor! I finished with equal verb. You have to joke about it because the alternative is to be scared out of your wits. Besides, the capital accent is so affected, almost anything sounds funny in it. I watch as Gail pulls out his knife and slices the bread. He could be my brother. Straight black hair, olive skin. We even have the same gray eyes. But we're not related, at least not closely. 
Most of the families who work the mines resemble one another this way. That's why my mother and Prim, with their light hair and blue eyes, always look out of place. They are. My mother's parents were part of the small merchant class that caters to officials, peacekeepers, and the occasional seam customer. They ran an apothecary shop in the nicer part of District 12. Since almost no one can afford doctors, apothecaries are our healers. My father got to know my mother because of his hunts. He would sometimes collect medicinal herbs and sell them to her shop to be brewed into remedies. She must have really loved him to leave her home for the seam. I try to remember that when all I can see is the woman who sat by, blank and unreachable, unreachable, while her children turned to skin and bones. I try to forgive her for my father's sake, but to be honest, I'm not the forgiving type. So I want to stop here because I feel like we've, our knowledge of the characters has really deepened a lot. For one thing, we've been introduced to a new character. We meet Gail, who is, seems to be a close friend of Katniss. He's also willing to like go into these illegal woods with her. Um, they both have gray eyes and it kind of signals that they had family members who were coal miners. Um, and we're kind of finding out more about Katniss's relationship with her mother. Um, so it seems like Katniss holds some anger towards her mother. Um, she felt like her mother wasn't there for her at a particular time when the students really needed, I mean, not students, sorry, kids really needed her. And Katniss is trying to forgive her, but finding it hard to find that place in her heart to forgive her. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to stop there to collect our knowledge about some of the characters. Gail spreads the bread slices with the goat, soft goat cheese, carefully placing a basil leaf on each while I strip the bushes of their berries. We settle back in a nook in the rocks. From this place, we are invisible, but have a clear view of the valley, which is teeming with summer life. Greens to gather, roots to dig, fish iridescent in the sunlight. The day is glorious with a blue sky and a soft breeze. The food's wonderful with the cheese seeping into the warm bread and the berries bursting in our mouths. Everything would be perfect if this really was a holiday, if all the day off meant was roaming the mountains with Gail, hunting for tonight's supper. But instead, we have to be standing in the square at two o'clock, waiting for the names to be called out. We could do it, you know, Gail says quietly. What, I ask, leave the district, run off, live in the woods, you and I, we could make it, says Gail. Hmm, and I'm starting to notice a problem starting to develop. So it sounds like there is, the district is going to be reading off names and we learned that it's for the Hunger Games. We don't entirely know what that is yet. Uh, but instead of doing that, Gail actually really wants to escape. He wants to run away, leave. Um, and go survive in the woods. So that probably means the Hunger Games is pretty bad. So next time we'll see how this problem develops. For today, your short response is, how does the social issue Katniss and her family face affect their daily life? Use two details from the text to support your response. And I'll just give you a hint. This is one of those short response questions that's almost like, a two-step question. Just like you have two-step problems in math or multi-step problems, this is like a two-step short response question because you're going to have to name what's the social issue that Katniss and her family face. You're going to have to name it. And then you're going to have to explain how does that affect their daily life? How does their social issue affect their daily life? Can't wait to see what you write and can't wait to continue reading this with you on Friday. Happy Wednesday, my friends.